Hello and welcome. My name is Jesse Ware, and I will be walking you through how to set up and manage your configuration settings in Sigma 2 for SOLIDWORKS, and how to use some of the more advanced settings. So what are the basics? Firstly, I will show you how to set your default configuration to give you a head start with every program that you make. Secondly, we will look at how to make a quick change to your settings for a one-off part or assembly. Next, we will look at how to save these configuration settings per the material and profile of the part, also known as material lookup keys. Lastly, we will look at how to modify these settings for material lookup changes. Once we cover the basics, we will look at advanced settings and how to use them. First, we will go through setting the fourth and fifth axis compensations and what are their differences. Then, we will jump into how to save the toolpath settings for your open section profiles, such as angle iron, C-channel, and I-beam. Finally, we will go through your sort settings and how to use these to control the flow of your toolpath around your part. Setting your default configuration will be the best way to ensure you are not constantly changing settings to get the toolpath that you want. It's easy to find and only found in one spot. Go to the Tools menu, hover over Sigma 2, Hover over Configuration and click Configuration. You will know this is your overall configuration by the Save as Default button at the bottom of the window. After you make your changes and set up your preferences on each tab, simply hit Save as Default and exit the menu by hitting OK. Sometimes it's best to find out your defaults through trial and error and what settings you seem to turn to the most. If you are unsure what your default should be, you can easily change them on the fly by clicking the Configuration button at the top left corner. Here you will be able to make changes that you will only apply to this current part or this current assembly's task. Please note in your assembly mode to make the change before clicking Auto Task, otherwise your change may not go through. But don't worry, if you want to make a change at the task level, we can do that too. In assembly mode, after hitting Auto Task with your tasks created, you can make a change to your settings. Say you wanted to change the lead-ins of Task 1 or T1's parts. You can simply click on your T1 task and then the configuration symbol, which is a wrench and a screwdriver, in order to make changes to this task only. Once you make a change, you can then generate toolpath and auto nest as normal. If you find you are making a lot of changes at the task level, consider using material lookup keys to save your settings. If you find you have a lot of settings specific to the profile of your parts, or have a machine that has tech tables for different profiles, you can activate material lookup keys to be used. This setting is found under the Advanced Toolpath Settings, and you need only check it on by default. The lookup keys will be saved in a lookup folder inside the post folder location. It is recommended that this folder not be moved unless absolutely necessary. Then all you need to do is set up your material grouping page and you are set to start creating your own lookup keys. To set up the material grouping page, you can go to Tools, Sigma Tube, Material Grouping. From there, you will need to add your material group and in the sub-items, make sure your material group name is there. Add the other material names to your sub-items that you would use in SOLIDWORKS. If your machine doesn't use SigmaTube to give it the tech table information, then you can simply use MS for mild steel, as we will default to that material every time. Once you have your configuration box checked for material lookup, and your material grouping is set, you can start building your lookup key database. To do this, simply go to Tools, Sigma Tube, Lookup Data. To add a new key, simply click Add and fill out the required information. Material, wall thickness, and profile dimensions are all needed. Lastly, if your machine requires it, you can connect the technology data path that your machine needs for its technology data tables. If you are unsure if your machine requires this, it will be talked about during Sigma tube training, or uh, it, will, it will be implemented as part of either an on site or remote training. You can always call or email support if you are unsure. 
Another way to add material lookup keys on the fly is to generate toolpath on new parts and profiles with the lookup key checkbox active in the configuration. If in assembly mode, you will be told which tasks do not have lookup keys. Also, when no lookup key is found, it will ask you how do you want to set your configuration settings. The options you can choose from are choose from database, which will let you choose from the lookup key list you have already made. Default material parameters will use the default configuration of the material you are using, for instance, mild steel, or you can use your active configuration. Once this is chosen, you can click on the material lookup checkbox in the left pane and SigmaTube will add the key for you, pulling the configuration settings you chose in the profile found using our feature recognition. After the material lookup keys are set, you have two different options for making changes. Editing the key in the lookup data parameters found in the lookup key table, or a bit more in real time, by the configuration box marked with a yellow cylinder next to the material lookup checkbox on the left hand window pane. Notice now that we are using lookup keys, the symbol has changed from the wrench and screwdriver to the yellow database cylinder. You will need to be on the specific task you want to make a change to if you are in assembly mode. Use the material lookup window below to view the lookup key ID, material group name, part thickness, shape, and size. By clicking on the button, it will open the configuration window again. You can make your changes and then hit OK. After this, a message will pop up asking you to update the changes to the material lookup key. You can of course click accept to update the lookup key, or you can hit no so that it's only an active configuration change and will not affect your lookup key. Now that we know how to make and save configuration changes, what should we change then? One such setting is to use fourth or fifth axis tool compensation. These can be found under the toolpath settings in the configuration. Fourth axis compensation is used whenever a cut requires a tilt, but the machine is either not capable of tilting or the process would take too much time at the machine to bevel. Fourth axis can apply to copes, miters, or even angled holes. The concept is that the toolpath will follow the inside profile of your part and change the toolpath to brown when applied. This will cut some extra material off at the end, but it will ensure for a good fit for your parts when they are ready to weld. In the picture example, we have a rectangular tube and a mitered end and fourth axis compensation applied. Notice how during the transition from the green toolpath to brown, we move the toolpath back away from the edge. This follows the inside wall until we are on the other side cutting the green toolpath again. You also have the option to apply this setting only to your end loops, ignoring all the internal features and holes. If your machine is capable and part needs to come out exactly, you can use fifth axis cutting instead. Fifth axis cutting has two different styles, swarf and principle. The first, swarf, is your general applied tilt and bevel capabilities to your parts. Sometimes you may find the geometry requires more intricate toolpath. That is when principle can be applied. It will apply small adjustments to the tilt angle and yield a smoother and more stable cut. You can see in the image how a combination of low arc tolerance and principal cutting will cause small adjustments of the tilt angle. If your machine does not allow the torch to have lateral movement in the y-axis while tilting, you will need to check the no lateral movement checkbox. This will prevent SigmaTube from using the y-axis and if your model requires, you will be given a warning about the toolpath unable to apply its curve. This will also be denoted on the part with a dark blue toolpath and warning symbol on your loops in the toolpath tree. In these cases, it may require a tweak to the model to change the curvature of the feature. This generally happens when using the SWARF method as well and using principle would be the preferred method instead. 
Another common setting that may need to be changed is the open section settings. These settings can be found in the configuration under the advanced toolpath settings. With the drop down menu for the open section part types, you can choose which profile settings to tweak. You can get started by setting a default setting for the profiles that you cut the most, or you can edit each type for a material lookup key. You will only need one part type per lookup key since it will only be used with that profile anyway. The differences may come with the changing material types. We will cover the most common types, angle iron, C-channel, and I-beam. Starting off with angle iron, we have two tabs, one for each flange. The cutting order for a flange goes as follows. Start with P1 to perform a height sense touch with the material. Wrap it over to P2, turn the torch on, and begin cutting into the part, making way to P3. When we hit P4, that will be your lead out, and the cutting will stop short with the first flange as we enter the thickest part of the material. If your machine supports it, you can also customize the cutting conditions to control the feed rate output for each E zone of the cut path. The E-Zone boundaries will give the machine enough time to apply curve within the lead-in E1. Set cutting conditions as you enter the radius, E2, your straight cut quality, E, and the thickest part of the material, E3, and finally, your lead-out away from the part, E4. Notice how flange 2 does not have the trim cut settings due to the fact that this flange will be the final cut to free it from the stock. The trim cut settings can be used to determine how far into the thickest part of the material we will cut. At 100%, we will stop right at the edge, lead out if we have a lead out, then rotate over to the flange to, to cut. If we were to change this to 25%, like the image on the right, notice how we are cutting much farther and leaving only 20% of the flange length left at the end. Edge length can be used instead to tell SigmaTube how much material will be left in inches or in metric depending on your units. You will want to be careful not to cut too close as this can cause the material to drop early when cutting causing potential for collisions. You also want to take care not to leave too much material as the piece might not separate cleanly with too much slag buildup. C-channel will follow most of the same settings the main difference here is that the C-channel consists of two flanges and a webbing. The flange settings will mimic much of the angle iron settings as well the cut order from P1 to P4 and the trim settings. Much of the other profiles will follow this same pattern of flange and web settings. To know the order of cuts, we will cut in order of the tabs from left to right. Start with flange 1, cut flange 2, and finish with the web cut that will allow the part to be cut free. Again, you will want to make sure that you are setting enough distance with your trim cut to allow for the cleanest finish possible. I-beam will have a different flow of cutting, but the general format and procedure remain the same. This time, we will start with the web cut before cutting the flanges. The web cut is now adjusted as a percentage of each side on the flange as it enters the center of the flange, E3. With this in mind, it will adjust the cutting condition to a higher power to ensure penetration before dialing back on either side of the web to prevent blowout. The web settings for I-beam is going to be unique from the other profile types. We will only cut the web from one side. Starting from the center of the web, and moving toward the E1 radius before doing a rapid back to P1 and cutting to the other side at E2. We have settings to determine how far into the corner radius that we will cut in the form of a percentage. Set the cut conditions and a break distance to allow for smoother transition and more coordinates in the G-code. Lastly, you can lock the chuck while cutting the web corners to force the torch head to do all of the movement the picture on the left shows the web thickness and length of the E-zone at 100%, leaving the entire web with the cut condition that was set for E. 
On the right, you can notice at 15%, we reduced the zone down to just 15% of the web thickness. Also note that the radius cuts are only being half cut due to the web corner toolpath being set to 50%. Sort settings can be necessary to change to make sure the features are cut out in the correct order without having to reorder the loops one by one. We can take advantage of settings such as the zigzag sort, which will jump back and forth between features as it moves down the part. The typewriter sort will be used for machines that complete one face to a certain length, then come back to start the loop and cut down the length again. The sorting zone length will allow you to break the part down into multiple zones. This will make sure the part finishes this zone before moving on to new features in the next zone. The angle tolerance will allow you to free up or restrict the rotation of the chuck to features within a certain range before moving on to the next cut. X tolerance will determine if a feature's center is within the tolerance of the zone to include it in the first zone and not the second, meaning this next feature is the most logical next cut. Sort preference will adjust how the processes are handled, like etching, along a nest of parts. If by part, we will cut every process, including etching, on the part before moving to the next. If by process, we will handle all of the etching down the length of the stock, then come all the way back and cut the parts. This setting is not recommended for long machine lengths that require a series of chucks to move the stock back and forth throughout the machine. To help visualize the sorting zones, you can activate the sorting feature in SigmaTube and change the zone size. Each plane divides one zone from the next, and SigmaTube will ensure all within the zone gets cut before moving on to the next zone. The angle tolerance on the right has been adjusted to 90 degrees, meaning we can rotate the part all the way to 90 degrees to select the next feature to cut. Notice when doing this, we have several more rotations on this part compared to the left with angle tolerance of 10 degrees. These are just some of the settings offered with SigmaTube to help each programmer streamline their process and create a standard for their parts. From setting defaults, creating lookup keys, knowing how to change on the fly, and some of our advanced settings, you can see the benefits for streamlining the process and workflow within SigmaTube.